The southeast corner of England has always been vulnerable to invasion. It was here that the Romans built their chief administrative centre. The coast has been attacked by Angles, Saxons, Jutes and Danes, and more than once devastated by the French. In the Middle Ages, five towns formed an alliance for mutual support and were known as the Sink Ports. Hastings, Romney, Hyde, Dover and Sandwich. During the 13th century, Sandwich was the main harbour in England for the export of wool and woven cloth. But now the sea has receded. Today, this small market town in Kent is no longer a port and lies on the silted up estuary of the River Star. Sandwich was provided with ramparts in the 1380s and these banks of earth still separate the town from the flat open countryside beyond. By 1400, the shape and layout of the town was very much as it is today. In the centre, there are streets which are still no more than 10 feet wide. Just enough, it's said, to accommodate the ox carts which once had to thread their way to the waterside. There's an exceptional number of timber-framed houses here, but a good variety of brick, too. Some of the architectural shapes and building materials are particular to Sandwich. And the town presents to the eye a wonderful roofscape. Beautiful pan tiles and handmade plain tiles too. Could any roof be more delightful than this one of the parish church of St. Clement? This church also retains a grand tile of Caen stone, built by the Normans. It's a central tower with a robust stair turret at the northwest corner. Apart from the churches, mason stone plays only a minor role in the picture of Sandwich. We do see it, though, on the quay by the River Star in one of the original gates of the old walled town. There were five principal gates, of which only this one, the Fisher Gate, now survives. The 14th century part is of flint and stone in a disorderly patchwork. The upper part, said to date from 1571, but looking decidedly Victorian, is in pale gaunt brick. The gate on the toll bridge is known as the Barbican and was part of a chain of defences against the French built along the coast in the 16th century. The only local stone readily available in Sandwich is flint and it's used here at the Barbican in combination with core stone from France and Kentish rag to make a checker pattern. Usually the flint work at Sandwich is rather crude, but not always. In Harnett Street, there's a section of garden wall with flints that have been both napped and squared, a truly remarkable feat of craftsmanship for 1400, if, as the Department of the Environment asserts, that is indeed their date. The most ambitious example of flint building here is the front of Pelican House, which was formerly St. Peter's Rectory. The builder certainly enjoyed himself here. 
A special feature not often found in this town is galety. Now the gallets are little chips or slivers of, in this case, flint, pressed into the mortar while it was still wet. These served to reduce the amount of mortar exposed to the weather. And because flints are so amorphous, this is often quite a lot. This, like many of the houses in Sandwich, is timber-framed in origin. Indeed, the southwest side of Strand Street is said to possess the longest continuous run of timber-framed houses in England, 41 in all. But this range is largely spoiled by bad and wholly unsuitable windows. What does survive, however, is the right half only of a late 15th century doorway with lively carving in the spandrel. There isn't much ornamental carving on the timber-framed houses at Sandwich. Far and away the most enjoyable, without a doubt, is this centaur on the corner post of the King's Arms opposite St Mary's Church. What a shame that the poor creature has lost his nose. What we find wherever we go in this town is the jetty, the projecting upper story. That is an infallible indication of a timber framed structure. Sometimes the ground floor was built out later to bring it flush with the face of the building above. This would usually be done in brick, which might then be rendered, or at least, as here, whitewashed. Incidentally, this building incorporates a pointed arched doorway of stone which belonged to an earlier house reputedly burned by the French. It can't date later than the 13th century, this doorway. Once the timbers have been plastered over, it isn't usually a good idea to expose them again, although this is still a very popular practice. It isn't a good idea because the plaster, which is rather heavy, is normally carried on laths. And once these are removed, the oak studs, as they're called, are seen riddled with nail holes, which don't look well at all. These old timber-framed houses were occasionally given an overcoat of weather body to make them a little less drafty. Here's an example. The boards are pine, probably imported from the Baltic, and always, of course, painted. More common in England, was the practice of removing the plaster and substituting bricks, what is known as brick nogging. The idea was to make the houses warmer, but this didn't always work out, because the bricks were so heavy that they were liable to cause the timbers on which they rested to sag, so that new apertures might appear at the top of each panel. Often, they were set in herringbone fashion. But on this house, unfortunately, the bricks were later whitewashed. They originate from the Tudor period, when, in fact, Sandwich was in a sad state of decline. The town was severely weakened by French raids, and also, during the 15th century, by the silting up of the estuary, which meant that the harbour could no longer accommodate large ships. So the town's vitality as a port greatly diminished. What saved it was a sudden influx of Flemish refugees escaping from the Spanish persecution in the Netherlands. 
Many of them settled where they'd landed, here in Sandwich. They were weavers, producing in particular serges and flannels, and as today they were tremendous gardeners. It was they who introduced market gardening into England. They also left their mark upon the town's architecture. By 1582, when Sir Roger Manwood's free grammar school with its five Flemish crow-step gables had just opened, there were nearly 400 refugees in the town. And a generation later, there were said to have been more Netherlanders here than Englishmen. The Dutch and the Walloons, having no stone, had a very long tradition of brick-making, at which they had acquired great skill. They were quick to rescue the Church of St. Peter from disaster, and if the materials they used for restoration weren't traditional, their expertise was certainly exceptional. In 1661, the tower of St. Peter's Church suddenly collapsed. This was the church which had been granted to the Dutch refugees for their services. They set about rebuilding almost immediately with nothing better than crude mud from the riverbed for making their bricks. Given this limitation, they made a surprisingly good job of it. This is the garden gate of what's now called the King's Lodging in Strand Street. There's a nicely shaped gable and a feature known as brick tumbling. We notice that some of the bricks are laid diagonally to form a series of triangles. The purpose of this was not only ornamental, but practical. For laid in this fashion, you've got a much smoother face for the coping bricks. This device is only found in counties on the eastern side of England and was another importation from the Netherlands, where it's much commoner than here. The Dutch built with very small bricks, so-called Dutch bricks, about six inches by two and a half by one and a quarter. These delightful little bricks can be seen all over the town. And another pleasing example of the Dutch legacy is the presence here of pan tiles. Few towns, it could be said, have tile roofs of richer colour and texture than this one. The most complete example of the Dutch manor in the town is this one. It's a complicated elevation and not, I feel, completely successful. It's so busy, too much is going on. It's an elaborate piece of brick craftsmanship, but later it was unfortunately smothered with whitewash, a great pity. And there are other houses in the town covered in paint. Look at these. Strawberry ice cream. Vanilla. Wheat cafe au lait. French mustard. 
Battleship Gray. O'Daniel. The aesthetic propriety of painting or whitewashing brickwork is controversial. In general, I would say, the better the bricks, the less the justification for it. Especially as, once done, you're lost. You can never really get it off again. This house ought to be red. It was painted white. Now it's dark grey. Not, in my view, an improvement. Nonetheless, a good deal of the brickwork in this town is unpainted pale yellow or brown brick. The London stock brick, in fact, made at Sittingbourne and other places on the south side of the Thames estuary. In the Regency period especially, this kind of brick was regarded as more elegant. Red was regarded as too hot and had become unfashionable. The house opposite, also early 19th century, bears this out. The front is brown, with red confined to the high-quality gauged window heads. But at the side, they didn't mind using red bricks, which were locally made and cheaper. It was yellow brick which was used to reface Crammond House. Again, on the front, reds, all wedge-shaped rubbers and made with the utmost care, are confined to the window heads. This was originally an Elizabethan house, so of course was timber framed. And at the back, some of the timber framing is still exposed. Not many people in Sandwich, stuck with timber framed houses, could afford complete Georgian rebuilding. So what a lot of them did was to create a new façade, of which the most enjoyable feature was often a fine Georgian door case. One thing that the Georgians never, never did was to use the bullseye. The bullseye is the lump in the center of a disc of crown glass to which the glass blower's pipe was attached. In the 18th century, it was always discarded. Nowadays, for some extraordinary and quite unaccountable reason, bullseyes are very popular in some quarters. Needless to say, they're quite anomalous, a faux pas, in fact. But the place to see fakes is in Market Street. Here, the principal buildings are nearly all Victorian. This one, especially in the gable, reiterates a recurring theme, the Dutch influence. The aprons under those pinched first floor windows are pleasing. The building is very tall, but then so is Lloyd's Bank, three doors away. Both are too tall, but in a way they justify each other. And at least they're not timid. Most of us probably have neighbours who are awfully nice and friendly, and perhaps a little bit dull. A good many people are like that. Well, I think that this library, with its pleasant-looking bricks and its precise scale, is also very like those neighbours. A more engaging building is the next one, which uh, used to be a bank. But how about the Golden Key Hotel? I like the terracotta pilasters and the heads, but the rest, it must be said, is something of a joke. In 
short. The Victorians liked to emulate the past, but all too often overdid it. Look at what they did at St. Thomas's Hospital, a medieval almshouse rebuilt about 1850. Pretty well everything is wrong. The walling exhibits a particular dislike of mine, what I call vertical crazy paving. The roof is covered with Welsh slate, not right for sandwich. Then there are the chimney stacks, faced with ugly cement rendering. And finally, a pullulation of chimney pots, one with a bright blue cowl. Even the lattice grills of the windows are so thick and clumsy that they must take a lot of light from the little rooms. How much better are St John's cottages? Built in 1805 and formerly St John's Hospital, another old arms house, about 20 years ago these houses were condemned. Happily, they were recently purchased by people who were able to realise their potential. The cottages were saved and beautifully restored. Here, the white paint is a delightful foil to the yellow-brown brick and the roof has handmade plain tiles. The delightful garden is small and homely and like many in the town has been tended with loving care. so to Sandwich's most elegant garden and its biggest surprise. As late as 1912, within the ramparts, space still existed to accommodate a major new building. It proved to be the town's grandest house beyond question, the Salutation. One of the major works of Sir Edwin Lutyens, who is now coming to be recognised for what he surely was, the greatest English architect of the last hundred years at least. The Buildings of England volume on Kent, usually so perceptive, dismisses this house as nothing but neo-Queen Anne. That judgement seems to me to be a long way out. Lutyens' earlier houses were designed in an arts and crafts style. But about 1906, he changed. Always delighted by the geometry of architecture, his work became more formal, more classical, carried through even to such a lovely detail as this flight of steps up to the front door. The debt certainly was to the Queen Anne style, but no house was ever like this one in the Queen Anne period. The three fronts, west, south and east, are interrelated, yet each is quite different. This south front is the least original, but it's so beautifully proportioned that it's extremely satisfying, to my eye at any rate. The dormers, so often a weak feature, are beautifully handled here, with their hipped gablets and laced valleys. The tiled sides don't meet the main roof at a sharp angle, but are carried gently round on a curve. That's what's called a laced valley. It's sometimes found on stone roofs, but with tiles it's very unusual, a typical Lutyens refinement. Two 
two things serve to unite these three elevations. The materials, the fine bricks with reds and blues judiciously mixed, the stone dressings, the white painted woodwork, and then the skyline, the high pitched roof and the noble chimneys, features which characterize his earlier style too. On the east front, the windows to either side of the center are arranged diamond-wise, an original feature, the appreciation of which is not helped by the invasive magnolias. The big garden, also designed by Lutchens on axial lines, despite an extremely irregular site, has had the benefit of rich alluvial soil deposited by the star. Gardens are exacting taskmasters, and few people today can maintain them as was originally intended. But happily, much of Lutchen's layout has survived. The planting has often been ascribed to Gertrude Jekyll, with whom Lutchen's many times collaborated. For this, there is in fact no documentary evidence, but it remains full of her inspiration. Ah, a brew. The South Lawn is in intimate relationship with the Palace Church, the tower of which is a glorious feature in the view. Nothing at Sandwich is so consciously planned as this gorgeously extravagant house and garden. But the town has been greatly enriched by its possessions. 